What's up, everybody? I'm Carmelo Anthony, and you're watching Real Talk, a series created by Jordan, dedicated to having real conversations on real topics. In a commitment to action over words, Jordan has come together to celebrate global impact of Black culture beyond one month or one country's perspective. This conversation between Black entrepreneurs in the UK looks at how they use entrepreneurship and community power to educate, nourish, and create opportunities within the community. As an entrepreneur myself, I understand the importance of empowering our communities through social action. These real conversations inspire us to all be part of building a better future for our community. Hey, it's your girl Mercedes Benton and I am joined by some amazing guests as we explore entrepreneurship and community power within the black community. Now to my right, we have Kojo Marfo, founder of My One Way Group and Shawnee Caballero, founder of The Go To Agency and co-founder of G293 Publishing. And to my left, we have Maria Pearl, founder of Razor Denim and Peter Santi, co-founder of Trap Fruits London. Now, I want to go right to the beginning of everyone's journey. Um, everyone on this panel is an entrepreneur, um, is a CEO, is a boss. Um, and, you know, to become that, an idea must have been sparked, a gap must have been seen for you guys to venture into all the creative pursuits that you guys are doing right now. I'd already been in the music industry about, for about four or five years. And after having my son, I took a job at PRS because it allowed me to work during his nursery hours. It was, it was dead on nine to five. PRS is the company that pays all publishing royalties. So many people were losing income just because they just, just lack of knowledge. Yeah. And when I was going to gigs, I was just asking people, you know, do you have a PRS account? And they just didn't. And outside of my job, I'd go around with my laptop and I'd just be meeting up with friends and setting them up. Nice. You know, because I would just say, you know, you're going to lose out on a lot of money if you right. don't have the correct accounts. And initially I set out to be an admin, just an admin company, once I had left PRS. And the first act I signed, he went top 20 on his third single. I was just sort of cleaning up within the black music space, getting really good signings. And then quite a few big labels like uh, Mixtape Madness hired me as their admin and I was doing all their roster as well. Sort of became a full fledged publisher. People are, are very grateful, like when I met P and he yeah. took me for lunch to thank me for helping him out. So don't thank me, make sure you're teaching. Yeah. yeah. Share the knowledge Share. that I give you. We, that's important. That's yeah, how we really. build a great ecosystem. Absolutely. I mean, P, you started in... <laughs> <laughs> you're having a little moment here. Thanks, P. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. P, you started in music. Yeah. And now you are a black owned grocer. It started with just me liking fruit. One fruit in particular called custard apple. Found it in Peckham. I was buying it for five pounds and I was giving it to people. One of my boys, Striver, so who I make music with Lonnie as well. He said, P, you're mad. Like, if you like it that much, why don't you like buy like a box, like wholesalers? And then from that, people just say, oh, get me this, get me that. Slowly, slowly, slowly. And then it just yeah. built from there, yeah. That's incredible. Nice. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, That's incredible. Yeah. And I think a lot of times the business idea or well, that spark comes from you wanting something. Yeah. Let me create something that is unique for me. Yeah, and yeah. then you realise, hold on a second, other people want this too. Yeah. I mean, Maria. <laughs> That's kind of how it started for you, right? I used to have a vintage online store called MPW Store. So I would like cut denim in a specific way. Anytime I would put it on my vintage store, it would sell out immediately. Mm. I was like, okay, everyone seems to like my denim. Yeah. <laughs> Let me see if I can do this. So from there, I started customizing denim in very specific ways. And it was challenging because I can only work with one thing. I really had to go into myself and just really tap into my creativity and everything. I just allowed it to take whatever form it did. Yeah. And yeah, it's worked in my favor now. So That's now, incredible. Yeah, now I've figured out what I want to do with that. And it's going to birth something new now. And I think the pandemic just kind of, it really allowed a lot of ideas to just flourish or, mm. and just a lot of risk taking because yeah. we were already in such a, you know, sad predicament. So it was just like, if we don't go for it now, when will we ever? Yes. Yeah. Do you That's know what I mean? Literally. So, I mean, Kojo, like you started my runway group like almost a decade ago now. Yeah. Wow. And now you have a store. Right. What was the transition from, you know, kind of starting it off to now having your own store in the heart of London? Like eight years ago, 
I had just, um, I was in Coventry University to study aerospace engineering because wow. I wanted to be a Jeez, pilot. <laughs> You wanted to be a pilot or your dad wanted you to be a pilot? No, I wanted to be a you pilot. You wanted to be a pilot. And then okay, once you're at university, you have to make yeah. sure you finish. And at that time, I started doing events because I wanted money to stay in uni. So I just thought, you know what? I like this event thing that I'm doing. Um, why don't I focus on it? It just became progressional. I realized that everyone that was asking to be a part of the team didn't have opportunities, especially in the arts. I just thought that, you know what, let me start some sort of a, a platform organization. And then very recently, we just realized that creatives are businesses themselves, you know. Absolutely. So we decided to um, give black business founders also an opportunity in terms of leveraging our network. So over the eight year period, we've just had worked with over 10,000 young creatives and over 500 um, black owned businesses. So. Last year, I said, we, I want us to have our own store and it has to be on Carnaby Street. And it really took off into like a community initiative. So if people happen to be in West End, let me go check out the black store. Yeah. I think, you know, a lot of us, we talk about our businesses and how we started it. Um, and it sounds so easy to yeah. some people, but I know that behind the scenes, especially if you're doing it by yourself or you're bootstrapping it, it's difficult. So I want to kind of know, like, what has been the realities for you when it comes to developing your business? First of all, my business partner was my best friend. So we're just fighting all the time. <laughs> and when we first started, it's in my flat. I'm working from there, I'm eating from there, I'm sleeping from there. It was all too much for me. It was all too much. But there's a strength in that, the 100%. fact that you are doing it with your best friend. Yeah. So that's why, again, another thing I want to say to people is like, just know that as well, innit? That just think, oh, just because your friend is going to work, it's not naturally going to work. It might yeah. not. You know what I'm saying? It might not. They might not have the skills that you might need to do the business and vice versa. You know, so I, I definitely want to say those things to people as well. You know, it's not all rosy. I mean, Maria, do you do Razor by yourself? Yeah, every single thing that you see, from the graphic design to the 3D motion, the creative direction, the website, the styling, the e-com, everything is all me. I realized that my mojo comes every other month, Yeah. right? So when my mojo is high, I create enough content for two months. Very good. And then for one month, yeah, I rest. do nothing. It's just also accepting that, you know, there's a price to pay for what you're doing. Yeah. You know, it's not easy every time, you know, people glamorize this whole entrepreneurship and it's like, no, nah, you, you pay. Yeah, it, you pay the price and then you experience yeah, you it. reap yeah. you reap the rewards in the end. So, yeah. yeah, challenges come, but they're all temporary. Yeah. I mean, surely you've got two businesses. Yeah. My son and my relationship with him got really strained at one point because you know, who was mummy? This working lady that I never saw. Right. And one Mother's Day, he wrote me a Mother's Day card and he said, mummy, you know, I love you so much, but you have to spend time with me and put me to bed. Aww. And yeah, but it broke my heart. And like, literally that week, I just canceled everything. Yeah. And I just said, you know, what? I'm a mum first. Yeah. Everything secondary. So it's juggling motherhood with, with having these businesses, I would say is, is the, the toughest challenge yes. of, of them all. I'm sure we'd agree we're all in this site for the passion. There's so much sacrifices you have to make. It's one thing being an entrepreneur and a founder and having to experience difficulties and challenges in running your business, but being a black entrepreneur, has that been different? Have you felt the difference in running and scaling your business because of the color of your skin? Um, have you experienced any yeah, issues with that? Well, a, a couple. A couple. <laughs> <laughs> we have to go fight twice as hard just to be level. Yeah. Imagine that. Say everyone's here, we start from minus 10 and then we go there. Yeah. That's a madness. Yeah. Th th imagine that. Imagine if we started level and it was level. Come on, come on. <laughs> think about it though. Imagine yeah. the heights that we're all reaching now. Yeah. I think, you know, what you're talking about is just important because community is everything. Yeah, like, even though we might be doing a lot of these things by ourselves, the fact that we're doing it for others and we're getting it back, you know, we're getting that support back and that love back is so important. It's about education and empowerment. We all know that saying, each one teach one. You see what I'm saying? So if I've learned something, I'm going to do the same for somebody else. Now, guys, I am so keen to know what your proudest moment has been in your life so far. I think my proudest moment has been um, founding Social Fixed, which is a platform that I created in 2017 to connect more black talent to job opportunities. My proudest moment in kind of context of Trap Fruits London and the green grocers and the fruit delivery business is being able to afford the opportunity to give people jobs like my little brother. 
you know, he's 16 years old. His first ever job has been with me, you know, packing fruit. And he's learning about business and invoices. I feel blessed to like be able to offer that to him. So that's, that's probably my proudest moment still. The fact that I'm here, I've been able to do everything, run multiple businesses, graduate from uni, the whole shebang, while having a child. Done. I was well, just happy you. to like, <laughs> really well I was just happy to, um, you know, not fall into the statistic route and just kind of show that like, you can still do it. It's definitely my book, A Quick Guide to Music Royalties. I'm really passionate about educating the music community. Um, I would say my proudest moment is running a store um, on Carnaby Street. So the very first time there was ever like a black owned concept store and with the history of Carnaby in terms of merging fashion and music culture. I mean, off the back of that, what does the future of, you know, the black community look like to you? So I think we're about to see um, an emergence of a lot of entrepreneurs in our community. A lot of people are beginning to understand how much they can empower themselves, their families and their communities. Especially amongst our generation, we're not putting up with nonsense in the office anymore. We're not, we're not putting up with, with any negative treatment, but we're just like, well, we know the power's us. We can just, that, you know, that's my story. I could just do this myself. We've got to a place where we don't have to depend on external sources. And I just hope that continues because Absolutely. I'm, I'm all for it. The only word that I could probably add to that is visibility, yes, you know, because yeah. we have already been doing our thing anyway. Of course. Mm. Everyone can see it in that. The pandemic really showed me that the strength of, like you guys have said, coming together as a community mm. and putting each other on like black owned businesses is a hashtag for me like yeah. and it's now an intentional effort yeah. like if i can get my fruits from a black owned business i'm going to do that of if course. i can get my denim from a black owned business i'm going to do that if i can get education and information from a black owned business go to your book right. i'm going to do that if i walk into a store i'm going to be intentional about you know yeah. where i'm going yeah. so i think for me it's just i i want the future of black people in our community to just be wealth and abundance so i just want to say you know a massive thank you for having you all on these chairs this panel um it really is a for us by us era right now and we're owning it and you guys are owning it so i appreciate you guys let's celebrate each other and just continue to rise amen <laughs>